Midterms still? <laughs> Every time I ask you for the last four weeks, it's been midterms. <laughs> when are you guys done midterms? Not including this class. <laughs> November? Ooh. So next week, what do you guys have? 391? Uh -huh. 330. I was told this week is 331. 374. Who's in 374? Ah, who teaches it? Dr. Eman Poor? <laughs> have fun. Uh, it's great. So, uh, actually, kind of a funny question for you guys. 374, is it just steel now? Just steel? It used to be both. It used to be steel and concrete. The first half was all steel, the second half was all concrete. And then Dr. Eman Poor said, I'd rather just do steel. <laughs> So now it's all steel, which I, I, I'm not sure. I, I think it's fun to learn both. Uh, 374 is the only structural class you have to take. So what happens is if you guys are just learning steel, young civil engineers are going to come out and not know what concrete is or how to design it. So I think that's kind of funny, but not really at the same time, more or less scary. But steel is not too bad. How are you guys finding design? Not too bad. The reason why I ask you guys is this, is because we have a very nice class. We have third years with y'all doing 372, and then we have fourth years doing 374 with Dr. Eman Poor. Now, the people on 372, they're not liking it right now. Does it get easier? What do you guys think? Is design easier than analysis? I am seeing a lot of yes. So for those of you in 372 who are freaking out a little bit, it gets easier. Design is always much more fun than analysis. All the time. So you guys are strapped with midterms. Well, I got good news and bad news. What do you guys want first? Bad news? I'm going to give you guys the good news first. <laughs> I'm going to extend the assignment this week. But not just assignment five. I'm going to extend all of them. Because what happens is, is every week I get <laughs> requests for extensions, every single assignment. So all of them, they're always due on Friday, 5 p.m. I tried to do that so that you guys wouldn't have to worry about it over the weekend. <laughs> Turns out you guys would prefer that. So I'm going to move them all to the Mondays. So you guys have an extra weekend for every assignment. All right, do you guys want the good news, the extra good news, or the bad news? All right, here's the extra good news. Since you guys are working so hard and you guys are absolutely swamped, which I don't blame you. I remember I, I was traditional, so for me this would have been third year. It was the most time consuming. It was the busiest I've ever been. Fourth year, trust me, you guys are gonna be laughing. Fourth year's fun. Well, the co not the co-op fourth year, but the actual last year, it's, it's fun. But you guys are busy right now, I understand that. Again, I went through the program, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take your lowest mark on out of the 10 assignments. And I'm going to give you guys 100. All right. It's the same as dropping a mark. So essentially, if you guys don't want to do an assignment that week, that's fine. Take the zero. And if that's your lowest mark, which it should be, <laughs> unless you somehow get a negative mark, it'll be popped up to 100. Now, if you guys want, you guys can still do every assignment. And I will take your lowest mark, let's say it's 95, well then that goes to 100. Again, I want you guys to have the option, if you guys just want a week off, take a week off. It, it becomes a lot. I was infamous for taking a week off. My friends hated me. I came in one time to submit an assignment, so go to the drop boxes. Do you guys even use the drop boxes anymore? Yeah, not really. Dropped it off, went to my friends, say, okay, have a good weekend. They said, it's Tuesday. <laughs> Doesn't matter. See you guys later. So yeah, take some time for yourselves. Make sure that you guys are enjoying your time. Before you know it, trust me, before you know it, you guys will be graduating. And you guys are going to look back and say, wow, I did nothing for the last four or five years. <laughs> so make sure you have those fun experiences. You guys are young. Now, it brings me to my second point. You guys are young. So I need some assistance. I got a comment on one of my videos. Lister people, the people in charge of Lister, asked me to prepare like a Eng130 motivational speech, whatever, something like that. <laughs> and, and I did, and I posted it, and kids seemed to like it. 
but it's still getting viewed now, and the midterm was a month ago. Like, it's getting more views now. And I got a comment, and the comment said, Clayton, thank you. I've been looking for this video, but all I can find were the Snapchat memes. <laughs> yeah, what? <laughs> so that's what I responded. What? What Snapchat memes? And then next thing you know, I looked back, the comment was removed. <laughs> so I'm not on Snapchat. I don't know anything about it. Could you guys find these memes? <laughs> I'm so curious. You have no idea. I've been made a meme four times, four times, and I have them all saved. Always from the Inch 130 kids. It's lovely. But knowing that there's more out there keeps me awake at night. <laughs> so if you guys know how to find them and you somehow find them, please send them. <laughs> I'm so curious. Because now I don't know if it's a good meme or a bad meme when the comment was deleted as fast as it was. So that's that. All right, you guys ready for the bad news? Oh, hold on, question. Oh, yeah, no, question. Yeah, it's, it's going to be all the same. I didn't really know how to describe it. So that goes into more good news. You guys want more good news. Today's lecture, you guys are going to love it. It's easy. Piece of cake. All we're going to talk about is the different types of responses. No calculations, no thinking. It's just going to be a nice, easy lecture. All right? It's going to be fun today. We're going to have fun. And I thought that's what you guys needed. Do you guys want a lecture full of calculations? Crazy equations? No, you guys just want to look at pictures. I remember in high school when they'd wheel in the video. Oh, those were the best days. Get a snack, relax. Well, it's going to be the same here today, except the material is probably a little bit more boring. All right, are you guys ready for the bad news? You ready? There is no bad news. <laughs> you guys are so pessimistic. Sometimes there's just good news. So again, the assignments have been extended. I'm going to drop the lowest mark, replace it with 100. And I guess the midterm's coming up. So one last question for you guys. I ask you guys to think about it. Do you guys want multiple choice or a mix of multiple choice and numerical? Just multiple choice? Yeah. All right. So the second midterm, it'll be just multiple choice. It is November 4th, so right before reading week, which is great because then you guys can have fun on reading week and not have to think about it. Do you guys have any midterms after reading week? Yes. <laughs> Who is that? 374. Wait, I, how many midterms do you guys have in my class? Two? Ooh. And it's with steel, too. <laughs> have fun. Steel's nice. Steel and design is nice because it's steel. Concrete's where it sucks. Masonry gets even worse. Timber's just weird. Wood is funny. The only thing you got to keep in mind with wood is that it decays. So it doesn't last very long. Well, it lasts pretty long, but it won't last forever. Masonry, that lasts forever. All right. I think I'm done my speeches for today. I'm trying to think of everything that I, I needed to cover. Yeah, just have fun tonight. All right, just relax. So, Oilers game on tonight. Who's going to watch the game? All right, perfect. A couple people. A little fun fact. I'm from Red Deer. I went to high school with Ryan Nugent Hopkins. Yeah, he was in my math class. He was very nice. Very. But that's saying a lot. So who went to Canadian high school? What are the hockey players like? <laughs> exactly. So he was one of the nice ones. I also went and had math class with Matt Dumba. Not so nice. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so a little fun fact. Like this. All right, classification of material response. We'll finally get in. It only took me 10 minutes. So today we're going to talk about the last topic that's going to be covered on the midterm, and that is material responses. Again, today is going to be no calculations. We're just going to try and classify the different types of material responses. That's it. Before we talked about strain, and we talked about strain measures, and you guys are an expert. Said, okay, strain's good, and then we just left it. Then we talked about stress, stress measures, and then we did some fancy proofs using momentum balance, so now you guys are expert at stress. And then we just left it. But one thing that you guys know very, very well, if you're in 374, 372, 270, whatever, stresses and strains are related. If I know strains, I can find stresses. If I know stresses, I can find strains. And that's what we're going to talk about today, and this is going to be the last topic before midterm two. 
expert on stresses, expert on strains, but how can we relate them together? So again, that's going to be the whole goal. Now, the response between them varies between materials. No matter what material you get, response is going to be different between them. The response to this table is going to be different than the response of this podium, which is going to be different than the response of this, I don't even know what this thing is, a projector, maybe? So that's what we're going to talk about today. It's just how can we classify these different responses? So the first one, and this is the big one, is the classification due to linearity. Now, like I said, in this course, we're always going to deal with linear elastic. But what exactly does this mean? Well, the mechanical response is termed linear, so again, linear, if the load is directly proportional to the response, resulting in a linear stress-strain relationship. So that's going to look something like this. If I have a linear response, it's going to look something just like this. Again, it's completely proportional. What has a response like this? What kind of material? Steel. It does. Before it yields. Concrete. Ooh, now I get you guys divided. Who thinks concrete has a linear response? Who thinks it does not? Who thinks steel has a linear response? And who thinks it does not? Is strain hardening linear? No. As you will see, most materials do not have a completely linear response. And that makes sense. If we break something, well, then we break the response. What we design for is usually the linear response. So in steel, we design before yielding. Concrete, it's the same thing. Concrete is a linear response, but instead of yielding, concrete cracks. So before concrete cracks, it's actually linear. After that, it becomes nonlinear. That's where steel and concrete kind of differ. Steel, we want it to not yield in design. Under normal conditions, we don't want it yielding. So all of steel design is based around this linear response, all of it. Concrete design, what do you think? Do you think we let concrete crack? Who thinks yes? Who thinks no? The answer is yes. The reason why it is extremely brittle, extremely brittle. I can crack concrete just by going and jumping on a beam. It's not that hard to crack. But is that okay? Well, the answer is yes, because cracking, how do I crack something? Can I crack something by compression? I can, but it's gonna be hard. Cracking is caused by tension in concrete, tension. Do we rely on concrete and tension? No, we rely on the steel inside of the concrete. So it's okay if it cracks. So the first one is going to be the linear response. And again, the key here is it's proportional. So if I were to say, okay, this is E, I can write the response as sigma, or stress, is equal to E times epsilon. What is E? Young's modulus. You guys will always say Young's modulus, and that's mainly when we talk about steel. For this class, I'm going to use the term elastic modulus because we use E for steel, we use it for concrete, we use it for timber, whatever. So I'm going to call it the elastic modulus. And again, if it's proportional, this is just going to be a nice constant. So as you guys can imagine, if I give you strain and I give you this constant value, you guys can find stress. Or vice versa, you guys can back calculate. So this is a linear response. Now, if our response is anything else, anything else, we call it a nonlinear response. So nonlinear response, for example, would look something like this. This is very typical what we'd see for concrete. It comes up parabolically, and it also comes down and then cracks and crushes, or sometimes it comes down kind of linearly. It doesn't really matter. But this is a nonlinear response. Do you guys think this equation applies now? What do you, who thinks yes? Does this equation still apply? All right, a couple. Who thinks no? It still applies. That is the key. This equation still applies. Clayton, how does it still apply? It's not proportional. Well, E now is a variable. It changes. What is E? What is E defined as? The slope. If I were to look at a point, let's say right here on my nonlinear response, does it have a slope? 
Yeah. So E has a value, it's defined. The only difference is, is what happens to the slope as I go further? It starts to decrease. Now the key here is the slope of these stress strain curves can also be referred to as stiffness, the stiffness of my structure. As we can see, what happens to the stiffness of my structure as I load it? What happens to the stiffness? It decreases. That's the key here. Everything, when it's perfectly fine, not broken, it has a certain stiffness. But if I were to start breaking this and press with the same force, it's going to deflect a lot more. Usually what happens is this decrease in stiffness is a result of the material being damaged. Concrete, for instance, it cracks. The more I crack concrete, the less stiff it's going to be. So that's going to be the key here. Now, we're not going to really talk about nonlinear responses because it becomes pretty hard. But one thing I will tell you is this. When we simulate these nonlinear responses, what we typically do is we select a series of points. This is how you simulate things like concrete. We define a series of points, and then we assume it's linear between them. So the more points you have, the better your response is going to be. It's going to be more accurate than the actual response. But what is the downside of putting in more points? What's the problem with just defining 1,000 points? Computation time. It's not easy for a computer program, and I, you, I was going to say, as you will see, but you won't see unless you come see me in graduate school. It's very difficult for the computer program to try and determine which elastic branch it's in. Because this stress strain response is for one point. That's for this point on my table. If I want to model the table, can I just model it with one point? No. I model thousands of points. So it has to try and figure out which point is where on this curve for thousands of points. That's why computation time starts to take so long. So again, nonlinear responses are associated with energy dissipation, which basically means damaging of the materials, and that's why it's difficult to simulate. But again, good news. Today's good news lecture. It's not bad news lecture. We're dealing with this. And our whole goal next lecture, when we get into the actual math, is saying, okay, we have stress. Do you guys know what's stress? The Cauchy stress tensor? Yeah, happy, happy. You guys know strain? The small strain tensor? Yep. What is E? That's all we're going to talk about next lecture. What is E? What is the relationship between these two? But again, today we're, we're having fun. We're just classifying materials. So the second classification I can give to a material is going to be based on energy dissipation. Who knows what energy dissipation is? No one. But this will be fun. Trust me, this is what saves you guys in earthquakes. So if material does not dissipate energy, or it does not, under cyclic loading, it is referred to as elastic. You guys have heard elastic before. What does elastic mean? it'll return back to its original state. If I were to pull my clicker and I stretch it and then I just let go, it's gonna go back to its original state, that's elastic. Now, what actually happens for elasticity, and we're gonna talk more about this after the midterm, is basically what happens when I pull this, it's storing energy. I put energy into this. And when I let go, what elasticity means is it's fully recovering all that energy I put into it. It's all in terms of energy. Inelastic materials will dissipate energy by damaging and will suffer permanent strain. So if this was inelastic, again, stretch it out, let go, it's not going to return to its original state. It's going to have some elongation. Now, what does this look like? If I had an elastic response, so let's say I have a nice linear response, and I were to take my specimen and I were to load it to this point right here. If this is an elastic response, once I unload it, it's going to go all the way back to zero. That's the key. It goes back to zero, which means that we have no strains. Now, energy dissipation, how we actually measure it, is it's the area under the cyclic curve. If I go straight up a line and then come straight back down, is there any area underneath it? No, there's not. So there's no area, which means there's no energy dissipated. 
And the other thing is that it returns back to its original position. That right there is an elastic response. In elastic response, so if we kind of go to concrete here, if I were to load my specimen up to the end, and then I were to unload it, as we'll see in concrete, it may go something like this. So notice two things. The first one, there's now an area under that curve. That is what we say our dissipated energy is. If you guys ever look at research and you guys look at how we test large scale specimens, walls, stuff like that, very rarely do we just push and break them. What you guys will see is we load cyclically and we get these nice loops called hysteresis loops. And what we're actually doing and the reason why we're loading cyclically is to try and determine this dissipated energy. Dissipated energy is the key. I said it's for earthquakes. What do you guys think that is? I already hinted at it many times in the seminars. If an earthquake puts 2,000 kilonewtons of force on my building, do I design for 2,000 kilonewtons? No. Do I design for more or less? Less. And the reason why is I use the concept of dissipated energy. Let's say that this was the 2,000 kilonewtons. So one way to resist an earthquake is to keep it elastic. But that basically means I have to push all 2,000 kilonewtons into my building and it has to store it in energy. That's where it becomes hard. It's very hard to store all that energy that an earthquake gives. So instead of trying to store it and then unload it once the earthquake ends, we can try and get rid of that energy by dissipating it. Every time something breaks, it releases energy. And that's why we purposely let things like concrete and steel break during an earthquake. We want it to release the energy the earthquake is throwing in. So earthquake design becomes really fun. You guys in 374 right now are using a bunch of fee factors that knocks down steel. What is the fee factor or phi factor for steel? 0.9. That basically means whatever your yield stress in steel is, you times by 0.9 to try and be conservative. In earthquake engineering, we times it by 1.2. We overestimate it. We overestimate it. Earthquake design becomes completely backwards than actual design. It's a lot of fun. And again, you want to try and design your structure to start releasing energy. We want our things to yield. We want our things like concrete to break. The only thing we don't want is the structure to actually fall down. If an earthquake hits right now in this roof, is this high off the ground? That's a win. Because it didn't fall. It gives us enough time to try and get out or, you know, that can cover. But that's the key here. We just don't want it to fail. And the reason or how we do that is we just rely upon dissipating energy. So that's why you see a lot of research going into this energy dissipation. Now, again, this is just fun facts. In this class, we're dealing with elastic responses. So it's going to be linear and it's going to be elastic. It makes our lives completely easy. Very, very easy. Now I got a question for you guys. Great midterm question. We talked about elastic responses and we talked about linear responses. Midterm question. Is every elastic response linear? What do you guys think? I'll give you a minute, just ponder it, chew on it a bit. Is every elastic response linear? What do you guys think? All right, time to vote. Who thinks that yes, if I have an elastic response, it has to be linear? All right, brave, brave. Who thinks no? I can have a nonlinear response, but still elastic. All right. The answer is it can be nonlinear. And you're saying, Clayton, how, how does that work? How does that work? If I need to come down and have no area, it has to follow the same path. Well, that's true, but that's the key. It only has to follow the same path. Some materials I can load up just like this, but when I unload them, instead of coming down, they actually go back along the same path. An example of that would be Rubber. Rubber has a nonlinear response, but it still remains elastic. It's one of those little fun facts. This response that I drew here 
this isn't representative of all materials. Every material has not only a unique loading response, but it also has a unique unloading response. This right here where it comes down linearly, this would be something like steel. If I load up steel like this and I were to unload it, it comes down linearly. If I were to take this and say this was concrete, so again, load it up, but when I unload concrete, it kind of comes down and then it curves. It kind of actually looks like a, like a flower petal, kind of. So every material not only has unique loading response, has unique unloading response. But this is just something for you guys to visualize. In this class, we're dealing with elastic responses, which is great. So next one is material symmetry. This is going to be the big one. Basically what happens is we're still going to deal with linear elastic materials, but there's going to be three different responses that we can look at. So materials can be classified as isotropic or anisotropic, depending on its dependence of loading direction. All right, loading direction. Isotropic materials are independent of loading direction, while anisotropic materials are dependent on loading direction. Have you guys heard of isotropic before? I'm not sure if you guys have. All right, I'm seeing F. Perfect. So this is great. So what does an isotropic material mean? Well, again, it's independent of loading direction. So if I were to take this material, let's say it's a piece of steel, and I were to load it horizontally, I'm going to get the following stress strain curve. Now let's say instead of horizontally, I load it vertically. If this is an isotropic material, I should get the exact same response. All right, that's what it means to be isotropic. It doesn't matter which way I load it, it's always going to have the same response. Seems pretty nice, right? Do you think structural building materials are isotropic? Who thinks yes? Who thinks no? The answer is yes. Isn't that nice? Steel, isotropic. Doesn't matter which way I have, which way I load steel. If I were to pull a steel plate in tension, it's going to give me a response. If I were to pull it the other way, it's going to give me the identical response. Concrete? Who thinks concrete's isotropic? Ooh. Yeah? Yes, concrete's isotropic. Can you guys give me a building material that doesn't seem like it would be isotropic? Wood. I don't expect you guys to know wood design, but how many of you guys have went camping? When you chop wood, do you chop it a certain way? You ever tried to chop it like along the log? <laughs> it's not fun. <laughs> As a kid, I thought it'd be fun. It, it's not fun. <laughs> So wood is an example of an anisotropic material. It depends on which way you load it. So this is isotropic. An anisotropic material, if I were to load it horizontally, it would look something like this. But if I were to load it, let's say vertically, I get a different response. Now, do you guys, well, actually, let's think back to the last couple of slides. I said, okay, we're dealing with linear, we're dealing with elastic. Do you think that in this course, we're only going to deal with isotropic? I said it's easy day, it's fun day. You think I'd give you anisotropic material? Who thinks no? Who thinks yes? The answer is yes. And you guys, Clayton, what? Why would you do something so mean? Well, here's the key. The complexity of a material isn't really defined by anisotropic or isotropic. It's always defined if it's linear or not, or elastic. The difference between these two in terms of calculations is literally just adding in two constants. Two constants. For an, for an isotropic material, you have two constants. For a transversely anisotropic, we have four. Can you guys handle two numbers? Yes. For other scenarios, it gets a little bit more complex than not too bad. And we're going to talk about that in the next slide. So I said that we have anisotropic materials. But as we're going to see, there's different levels of anisotropic materials. There's different categories of them. And that's what we are going to define next. So the different types of anis anisotropy, I don't, I can never say that word. <laughs> the first one is just generally anisotropic, which means there is no symmetric response. Every different way I load is going to give me a different response. Now that's something we won't deal with in this course. 
in order to completely define one of these materials, you need, I'm not kidding, hundreds of constants. I think 256. A lot. So we're not dealing with these. But then we have transversely anisotropic materials. And these materials exhibit a symmetric response along an axis that is normal to a transversely transverse plane of isotropic. What does that mean? Who knows what that means? I don't even know what it means. That's why I drew a picture. Let's say that this was our specimen. Let's say that this was soil. Okay, that's, that's what I think of it as. We have different layers, as we can see. Different layers, okay? If I were to load this horizontally, so this surface and then this surface, and this is all uniform, do you think that they would exhibit almost an identical response? Yes, if I'm loading it these different ways. Both of these faces are the exact same. What about if I were to pull it vertically? Do you think that would be a different response? Yes, because there's different planes of weaknesses now in this direction. Now, this is the formal definition. And what it means about this axis, it means that if I were to draw a vertical axis here, all of these horizontal directions would be identical. It's only that vertical direction where the response changes. So what I like to do to think of this is think of this. We have three directions, right? Three dimensions, 3D. A transversely isotropic material has the same response in two directions and a different one in the third direction. That's the best way of thinking of it. Response is same in two directions, a difference in that third direction. So this one I can test you on. But again, it sounds like it's a bad time. But going from isotropic to transversely isotropic, we're just adding in two constants. Two constants, that's it. The third one, orthotropic. So material has a specific response along three perpendicular axes. Again, this doesn't sound very nice. Essentially, what an orthotropic material is, if I were to have a cube of something, it means that the response in each of the three dimensions is going to be different. All right, it's going to be different in all three directions. Does that make sense to you guys? You guys have a good idea? Now you guys said that wood was anisotropic. Which category do you think wood falls into? One, two, or three? Two? It's actually three. Do I expect you guys to know that? No. If you guys ever take a wood design class, especially here at the University of Alberta, the first, I don't know, eight lectures are not design. It's the cells in the wood. Wood is made up of a bunch of fibers. And that's why it's so easy to split them because the fibers just split apart. But if I were to try and come perpendicular, the fibers are very hard to break. That's why it's hard to chop wood the other way. But these cells are actually rectangular in shape. Right? They're rectangular in shape. So if I were to compress it one way, it's actually a lot easier than if I were to compress it the other way. So it's orthotropic. Again, I don't expect you guys to know that, but now you do. And there's a good example that we're going to cover to help show you guys why. So that's isotropic versus anisotropic. The next one is homogeneity, all right? Homogeneity. I can classify a material response based on this. And basically what it means is it's independent of the specimen used in an experiment. What does that mean, Clay? Let's say I wanted to test just the surface of this table, right? I don't know why. I want the tensile response of this. If I were to take my piece to test right here and test it, I'm going to get a response. Now, if I were to come over here and test this piece, would you guys expect an identical response? Same material, everything. So that would be homogeneous. If I were to take two pieces from the same table, same material, and get different responses, that would be non-homogeneous. So I hope that makes sense. That's so I describe it, you have a beam here, and if I were to take a piece here, I'm going to get a specific response. But if I were to take a piece over here and still get the same response, this would be homogeneous. If the response was different, and let's say I even took another piece over here and got another different response, that would be non-homogeneous. What do you guys think? Is this also reminiscent of structural materials? Let's just talk about steel. 
steel, homogeneous or non-homogeneous? Barely homogeneous, that's probably the best way, yes. Barely homogeneous. If I were to take different tensile tests, they're going to be a little bit different, but it's actually very, very close. Steel starts to become non-homogeneous when we weld it. If I were to take a column and I were to weld a beam to it, that area where I weld, where I put all that heat, that starts to change things. Welds, the weld strength has much higher strength than the steel itself. So it becomes that area where the yield stress starts to change a lot. That's where it becomes non-homogeneous. Another example would be masonry walls. So I, I, I don't think you guys have ever designed any masonry walls, but basically what happens is we put the bricks down, we put mortar to put them together. Inside of the bricks, we put some steel to keep it strong. And then inside of that, well, not inside the steel, but inside of the holes, we put cement grout. Four different materials acting together. Is that homogenous? No. Some of the holes are going to be empty. Some are going to be filled with grout. Some are filled with mortar. <laughs> it, it's actually a mess. So those are non-homogenous examples. This is why masonry walls are hurting right now. The complex to design, and then concrete walks and says, hey, I'm easy. <laughs> Pick me. And then people say, well, you know what? I prefer a brick exterior. Concrete. We can do that. So they put these little fake bricks on the concrete, but it looks just like real bricks. So that there's been a big shift towards concrete lately because masonry is very hard to design for. The only thing that we have going uh, for masonry is the fact that it's old. You, you talk to any mason, they'll say, why pick masonry walls? You see the pyramids? Yeah, I've seen the pyramids. Still standing, aren't they? Exactly. But you notice how big those bricks are. So yeah, it's funny. All right. So the last one is the classification due to time dependence. This is a big one. This is one of those things that we never really consider, but it always should be considered. So a material response is termed viscous if the response is time dependent. Floating rates. A non-viscous material is that which is independent of time. St. Clayton, what, what does this mean? Let's say that I have three specimens, all right? And I'm going to put a force P and I want to measure their elongation. Exact same specimens. If I were to load this one as kind of a standard loading rate, I'm going to get the following response. What happens if I take the same specimen, I go to the same force P, but I load it much slower? Instead of just pushing it, I go, very slowly. Is the response going to be the same? Chances are no. You're going to get something like this. Now the opposite. What happens if I load it very fast? Do you guys expect a higher response or a lower response? Higher. It's going to be something like this. Very, very special. Now which structural material is this? You guys think that steel is viscous? Yes. Is concrete viscous? What do you guys think? Concrete viscous? Time dependent? Yes. How about timber? Time dependent? Yes. Masonry? Yes. Anything else? Yes. When we start talking about actual design, loading rates is very important. You guys mix concrete cylinders in 391. Have you guys done that yet? Mix them and then test them and blow them up? No? <laughs> well, that's one thing you have to look forward to. You load up cylinders. Well, actually, who, who's done concrete testing? Some of you guys. When you test the specimens and compress it and crush it, do you have to load it at a very specific rate? Yes. There's standards for that. You guys have heard of ASTM and all that fun stuff? Standards to make sure everything is consistent. We have those because if you have a bunch of different standards, you're going to get results all over the place. Now this is where it gets fun. Clay, if my response is different all the time, how can I effectively design something? That's a great question, isn't it? How can I effectively design something if I don't know what the response of my material is? Let's say it's you guys, you guys are in steel right now, and you guys come to me and say, all right, Clayton, I'm designing this beam. 
what is my yield strength? And I go, ah, it's going to be somewhere between 300 and 500 MPA. <laughs> what do you do then? Like, that's a big difference. And you can get that depending on how fast you load things. So what do you think we do in structures? Over-engineer? Over Again, that's good until an earthquake hits. Over-engineering would make a building fail an earthquake. This is where it gets really fun. Here's the key. The slower I make my response, it actually starts to converge upon a value. So let's say that this was really slow. And then I have to go one step further and say super, super slow. Well, the response is going to become almost identical. So we design for this lower bound. So we can treat these structural materials, which are viscous, as time independent when our loading rate is relatively low. So an obvious exception would be, of course, an earthquake. Our earthquake hits really fast. It starts to become dynamic, which is why it's hard to design for. Question for me, or I guess question for you guys. What is a relatively low loading rate? Of course, in the lab, we can specify how much we load. What about for this building? Can I specify how many people are going to walk through at a certain time? No, I don't know. How many people are upstairs right now? <laughs> no one knows. So what is considered relatively low? What do you guys think? It's when the load is just its self-weight. If I consider this and I were to put this down, well, the self-weight of this, that would be a low loading rate. When people walk across things, do you think it's a low loading rate? Who thinks yes? Who thinks no? The answer is it actually is pretty high loading rate. So what we do in design is we separate this into two components. We do the strength side, where you take your materials, you design for it. But then if you're designing a structure, you must also do vibration checks, vibration. If I'm walking upstairs and it's going, it's very uncomfortable. Everyone would hate you. So you do vibration checks to make sure that it's time dependence isn't too crazy. You don't want it, your structure to vibrate. Again, an earthquake, that's a whole different ballgame. So that's time dependence. Last thing we're going to talk about is two phenomena. Phenomena. How many of you guys have dealt with concrete before? Perfect. So you guys are going to see some fun things. So viscous materials or time-dependent materials exhibit unique phenomena which must be accounted for in design. This is, again, important. I'm making design sound really bad because there's so many checks, but here's another one. Not only do we have to design for a structure when it's built, we have to design for a structure long-term. We have to make sure that it is going to be fine in 50 years. You're saying, okay, well, that's not too bad. Here's where it becomes a problem, these phenomena which they experience. For concrete, and applies to other materials, it's creep. You guys heard of creep? Yeah. So this is an increase in strain over time while under a constant load. Constant load. So what happens in structures, if I were to look at my stress strain of, let's say, concrete, we're going to see the strain in concrete increase under the same load. Isn't that crazy? If I were to put 100 kilonewtons on here and just leave it, it's fine. But then over time, it's actually going to start deflecting downward. Who here has been to Europe? Have you guys ever walked in the old buildings, how all the floors are terrible? <laughs> That's why it's creep. So that my force isn't increasing, but my strain is. That's one of those fun things. So this right here is a problem in wood as well as concrete. And the problem is, is it creates a lot of deflection that you must account for. Now you guys may be saying, Clayton, how does this happen? How does this happen? I'm not loading it any more than normal. Where is this extra strain coming from? Well, it turns out it depends. It depends on the scenario. Creep is one of those things that's still studied quite a bit right now. Let's talk about concrete, because perhaps this will be one of the easiest ways for you guys to visualize. You guys mix concrete cylinders. You guys take all that powder, put it down, and what do you mix it with?
Water. Exactly. You guys ever made cement? Concrete's the same thing, just with rocks. You mix it with water. So is your concrete wet? What happens after 28 days? That's how long you have to let it cure for. Is it wet after 28 days? So what happens to the water? It evaporates some of its chemical reaction. So that's your strength after 28 days. But do you think that after five years, the water is still going to evaporate? The answer is yes. And that's what this is. One of the ones in concrete, and this is one of the factors, there's many more, that concrete components are going to change over time because it's losing some of that water. That's why it starts to plateau because the amount of water you can lose is of course finite, but initially this is what happens. So this is creep. Again, big problem in wood. If you guys have been to Europe, you guys will know that. And concrete. The second phenomena is called stress relaxation. This is something we see a lot in steel, particularly steel rebar. So rebar is what goes into the concrete. And what this is, is a decrease in stress under a constant load. What does this look like? Well, in my stress over time curve, it's going to be like this. So let's say that I were to again load this to 100 kilonewtons, right in the center. Initially, let's say that this was a piece of rebar. Initially, to hold that 100 kilonewtons, let's say it needed 500 MPa. I'm keeping my 100 kilonewtons on, but let's say five years later, it doesn't need 500 MPa. It goes down to 450 MPa. It requires less stress to hold the same load. Isn't that crazy? Now, you guys think that's a good thing or a bad thing? This, uh, my rebar has its stress decrease. When you're designing a structure, do you want the stresses to be higher or low? Oh. So who thinks that this is a good thing? Yeah, it's looking pretty nice, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> you guys are saying, what do you mean? You want your stresses to be high? Trying to hurt us? No. This is a big problem in pre-stressed concrete. Because remember, in pre-stressed concrete, we said that we put our steel like this, nice parabolic, so that when we pull it, it pushes our beam up, and it counteracts the loads we put down. If that stress that's keeping our beam up starts to decrease, well, then our beam starts going back down. So this is one of the biggest problems we deal with in pre-stress concrete is stress relaxation. Uh, if you guys take a design course, it's, it's very nice to see. Uh, it turns out the rebar does a lot of really weird stuff when it's pre-stressed. So a uh, problem in pre-stressed concrete, because we rely upon that tension in the steel. And that's basically it for the lecture material. So how was that today? Was it fun? I like talking about the different responses. It's one of those things that you don't talk about in grad school. It's something that you assume the students know, which is usually a big mistake. <laughs> but here it is. So it's nice because what's going to happen is next lecture, again, we're going to start and talk about what is E? What relates stress to strain? Well, E is going to depend on the material response. So at the beginning of every question you guys will see when it deals with topic, I think six now, it's going to say a linear elastic isotropic material or a linear elastic transversely anisotropic material. Now you guys know what those mean. It's all those different ways we characterize it. And those words are gonna be important because depending on what material it is, E is going to be different. Does that make sense? All right, wonderful. So let's see you guys test your knowledge. I have a quiz on E-class. I'm hoping that this pops up. All right. So it only goes to the screen <laughs> when I'm presenting a PowerPoint. Mr. AV Tech, <laughs> can I have some help? <laughs> How can I put my screen on when it's not uh, presenting on PowerPoint? Uh, 
That's a nice, easy quiz. You guys will be fine. Even if we don't get to it, I'll let you guys go early and you guys can do it in two minutes. It's just classifying the different responses. It's fun. Is it interesting? What do you guys think? Is it interesting or did I just waste 50 minutes of your life? Sounds cool? Yeah, it's very cool. So here's the fun thing, and I guess we have time. I don't really know you guys at all. <laughs> I always talk about structural, like you guys are structural engineers. It's usually what I deal with in grad school. They're all structural, well, actually, no, there's mechanical engineers. They're a pain. <laughs> but mostly structural. So I'm going to ask you guys. You guys are everything. You guys really haven't decided. How many of you guys are going to be structural? All right, all right, nice. Uh, construction. Nice, nice. That's where the money is. Congratulations. Uh, what, uh, water? <laughs> no, not a single one. All right, geotech? Ge yeah, no, geotech's fun. Geotech's fun. Again, good money in geotech. What else is there? Transportation? That's fun. <laughs> I don't know. Transportation never, it was just not too much fun for me. How about environmental? I think that they go into their own stream. I don't even know if they take this class. So, yeah, that, that's expected. It's wonderful. Oh, wait, that's also on the second screen. But it's also on this screen. All right. Did I make it go away? Okay, so it's on this screen. I'll go into E-Class without you guys seeing my credentials. Mm -hmm. Perfect, thank you. All right, two for two on the CCID. Today's a good day. Oh wait, that's not my copy. Yeah, never mind, two for three. Alrighty, here's the fun. So 398, that's you guys. E class page. Ooh, you guys want to see it? No? Okay. <laughs> I'll show you guys. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> Haven't even started. <laughs> Well, I had to ask you guys today first <laughs> if you guys wanted a multiple choice or not. All right, so examples, classification, and material responses. Let's see what you guys remember. Five of you have attempted this. I'm very proud. Three of you. All right, question number one. So I'll read it out. So you guys just need to look at pictures. It says the picture depicts a dent in a pipeline. The pipe was originally cylindrical, but during installation or mechanical interference, Permanent dents can form. What is this type of response? A permanent dent. A, a linear response. Who thinks that's a linear response? All right, so I'll cross it out. Who thinks that's a nonlinear response? All right, I see a couple hands, so I won't cross it out. An elastic response? No? A non-elastic response, all right, and both B and D. So B, non-linear and non-elastic, all right, I see a couple hands. What do you guys think? Should I click check? You guys going to embarrass yourselves? You guys did it, see? Proud of yourself. Here's wood. As a structural engineering material, wood has fibers that cause a response that is dependent on loading direction. This is an example of what? A linear response, who thinks? All right, I see a lot of head shaking also. We'll cross this out. An isotropic response, I see some yes, and I see some no. So is it yes or no? All right, I see no's. An orthotropic response, okay, so I won't cross it out. A viscoelastic response, basically a visc viscous response. No? All right, so I'm seeing no. So you guys leave me with one option. Are you guys two for two? You guys are two for two? Try to make it interesting. 
put some wagers on it. Do you guys think you can go six for six? Maybe. What are you guys willing to bet? <laughs> An easy midterm versus a hard midterm? And I told you the midterm's gonna be easy no matter what. I'd never do that to you guys. I gotta try not to get roped in. In Engine 130, I bought the class pizza. That was so expensive. <laughs> I wasn't expecting it. And the problem is, is it was later in the year, it was right before reading week. So by then I had a bunch of students from other sections coming over. So I didn't have enough. I will blame them. Don't blame me. All right. I didn't know what to do with all the cardboard either, so I just left it. <laughs> I could have built a fort with all that cardboard. I would do the same for you guys because I like you guys, but I'm not sure how much trouble I'd get in the university having a pizza party during this pandemic. <laughs> so I'll try and avoid that for now. But if you guys want anything, let me know. If you guys get a high average on a midterm, why wouldn't I reward you guys? You deserve it. I know Sam dyed his hair purple last year. I don't know what bet he lost, but he was in one of my committee meetings and he's asking these questions and I was just looking at his hair like, wait, what was the question? <laughs> All right. So the figures show the true and engineering stress strain curves of specimens obtained from different locations in the pipeline shown above. It says, and that it's dependent. For example, specimens from the weld area show that by design, the welds exhibit a higher yield and ultimate strength than the base material. What is this an example of? A viscoelastic response, yes or no? Is this talking about time dependency? No. So we can cross that off. A homogeneous response. All right, I see some no's. A non-homogeneous response. All right, I'm seeing lots of yeses. An orthotropic response. That's a good one. An orthotropic response. Do you know that this material is orthotropic or isotropic? No. But here's the key. Are all the specimens loaded in the exact same direction? So can we even conclude that if it's orthotropic or not? No. So we can get rid of orthotropic. And last one is both C and D. <laughs> really wanted to get you with that orthotropic. So you guys are good with C? Any changes? All right, let's see, three for three. You guys got it. All right, next one. This is pre-stressed concrete. So this is exactly what we do. We pull it and on site it looks like this. This is why construction people get paid the big bucks because it looks nice. <laughs> when we design, this is our design. <laughs> and then in the field, this is what it looks like. So all of those blue tubes that you guys see, those would be our pre-stressed fibers. We encase them so that we can pull them. The ones not encased are just regular rebar. All right, so it says the picture shown, or this picture shows the application of pre-tension cables. Pre-stressed tendons is the actual word, but I know Dr. Sammer didn't know that. Uh, in concrete beams and slabs, these cables are used to provide an uplifting force that counteracts the vertical load applied. In musical instruments, the strings are pre-tensioned, blah, 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 blah. Here's the key. Over time, the tension in these structures are lost and need to be re-tensioned. This is an example of a linear response. Who thinks linear response? No. Visco or viscous response. I see yes and no. Ooh. Is it visco? I see no. I see yes though. Which is okay. We got to put it to a vote then. Yes. Viscous response. Who thinks no? I think there's more yeses than noes. So we're gonna keep it. We'll talk about after. Is this an example of creep? What does creep have to deal with? Stress or strain? Strain. This right here is talking about tension. This would be the stress. So this wouldn't be creep. Is this stress relaxation? Yes. Yes. We have, oh, so you're just voting? Sorry, I have a question. <laughs> All right. So do you guys think it's just stress relaxation? Or do you think it's stress relaxation and viscous? Who thinks just stress relaxation? Okay, who thinks both? All right, there's more both. So I'm gonna click both and let's see how you guys do. 
Got it. It's both. And here's the key. Creep and stress relaxation, they're phenomena associated with viscous response. Both creep and stress relaxation, they happen over a long period of time. The key here, time. Anything associated with time is viscous. All right, let's go to number five. So we got somebody's deck. It says the picture provides an example of a concrete slab that over time has increased in deflection under its own weight. This is an example of, so if you guys look at a picture, it's now deflected. So would this be a linear response? All right, I see a lot of no's. Viscous response? Yep, and again, the key for this is always look at over time. Anytime you see time, it's gonna be viscous. Uh, is this creep? Okay, is this stress relaxation? Nope, so we cross that out. Both B and C, so viscous and creep. All right, I don't see any contradictions. We'll check it out. You guys got it. All right, can you do it? Can you guys go six for six? Can, what do you guys think? Can you? Easy? But it's, it's a biology question. Those are never fun. Remember when I talked about how things respond? How structures, they have nice principles? And then you look at biology and it all goes out the window? Well, let's see. So the picture, this is classic Dr. Salmon. It says soft tissues such as ligaments, muscle, and cartilage are composed of two phases, a solid matrix and a fluid that is mostly water. Upon loading, soft tissue exhibits a stiff response, and as the fluid moves out of the tissue, the stiffness decreases. And what is stiffness? The slope of the stress strain curve, E, exactly. So this is an example of, and it's funny because this is actually exactly how wood goes. Those so cells in wood, they fill with water and the response becomes different. When the water goes away, the response changes again. It's kind of funny. All right, so is this a nonlinear response? All right, I see a lot of yeses. Is this a viscous response? Oh, well, I'm very silent. Who thinks yes? Okay, who thinks no? All right, so there's more yeses, I'll keep it. An orthotropic response. <laughs> who thinks yes? Okay, who thinks no? Okay, so I'm gonna cross it out. There was more no's. So is it gonna be A, B, or D? Or D is both A and B. Or is there still a brave person who wants to go with C? It, it's a pretty good hint when the, the, that last option doesn't have C, that C is probably not it. And I'll give you a hint, it's not C. The only way we can determine if something is orthotropic is if the question mentions that we tested in different directions. We didn't do any of that, so we can't conclude anything. A, B, or D? Yes, thanks. Should I make it interesting? You guys want to wager? The moment of truth? No? It doesn't say anything about time. It doesn't say anything about time. How could it be viscous, right? Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> moment of truth. All right, what do you guys want? What would make your guys' lives so much easier in this class? Five second midterm? No, Oh, no second midterm. <laughs> that would mean your first midterm is your entire 40%. Is that what you guys want? When I said the second one's going to be easier? No, exactly. All right, all right. How, how about this? I'm, I'll do a review session, of course. What happens if I do a second exam? I'll do two exams for the review session. I only did one exam the first time. How about two exams? How about three exams? No, you guys are too greedy. No. We'll have to do a different challenge. Well, I'll do two exams if you guys get it. So is it A, B, or C? Or A, B, or D? Who thinks D? Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All right. Eight for D. 
Who thinks it's just eight? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, oh. So, so far it's just D. All right, B. All right, no, no one thinks it's just B. A any contradictions? You guys ready? Second midterm. I was going to do it anyway, so joke's on you guys. <laughs> Let's see. You got it. Now, the question is why? Why was it viscous? It didn't say time. But how do you, it said that the stiffness decreases as the water leaves the cell. Does that just happen instantaneously? It takes time. So that's why it's that. But yeah, I know you guys did it. I'll do two midterms. And it's fun watching you guys sweat. So maybe we'll do something else and I'll do all three. But well, that's it for today. Let me know if you guys have any questions and I'll see you guys in the seminar later on.